In the year 1946, from May 2nd to May 4th, one of the bloodiest escapes in history was attempted at the prison nicknamed Alcatraz. One of the six escapees had purposefully starved himself and is able to squeeze through the bars to give him access to a gun gallery. Now armed, the prisoners force guards to open up the isolation cells. What ensues is the Battle of Alcatraz, a furious fight that ends with two officers dead and 14 officers wounded. Three prisoners are also killed, and two are later executed for their participation in the battle. What could have driven men to become so desperate and so violent? This is what we'll try to figure out today. That wasn't the first escape attempt from the prison that even the most hardened criminals feared, and it wouldn't be the last, in spite of the fact that trying to get out of Alcatraz was an extremely deadly ambition. Even if the prisoners did get to the beaches surrounding the fortress of Alcatraz, there was every chance that their dead bodies would end up being scooped out of the frigid waters sometime later. First, we'll come back to these insane escape attempts and perhaps one that was successful. But first, we need to ask ourselves this. If trying to escape statistically gave the prisoner a good chance of being shot or designated missing and presumed drowned, why did they keep trying? What was so bad about Alcatraz? Long before this place was called the end of the line for difficult criminals, it was used as an army barracks and then a military prison. In 1934, it became the property of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, with the authorities hoping it could contain some of the most vicious and difficult criminals in the USA. From 1920 to 1933, the country had experienced a devastating rise in crime because of a harebrained thing called the Prohibition, with crime rates going up in 30 major US cities by 24%. This war on one of the most popular drugs wreaked havoc on society. And then, if things weren't already bad enough, starting in 1929 and lasting for a decade was the Great Depression. It was a bad time to be an American if you came from one of those places they called the other side of the tracks. So this was the climate when Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary first opened its doors to who the authorities said was the worst of the worst, the criminals that were almost beyond rehabilitation. These were the folks that were labeled the incorrigibles. If you were a criminal back then and deemed a menace to the prison where you were already incarcerated, one day you could have been knocked up early in the morning and told you were getting a transfer. After that, you'd been taken to a specially designed train coach, where you were shackled and handcuffed with a bunch of other prisoners, not to mention surrounded by around 60 FBI agents and US Marshals. All you would have known is that this was big. Something big was happening, but you'd have no idea you were being taken to a hellhole like no other. At a place called Tiburon, just north of San Francisco, you'd have been taken by barge to San Francisco Bay. Never in your life would you have seen so many armed guards, although almost every prisoner with you has a solid reputation as being what the authorities called an agitator. It's at the bay that you catch your first glimpse of the warden and his assistants, who due to their stern reputations and dogged toughness have been nicknamed Iron Men. Once on the island, these men march you and the others single file to where you're stripped and searched, after which you're given a number and told which cell block you're going to. For you, it's cell block B. Although at some point during your stay you'll likely end up in cell block D, the dreaded isolation block. You walk into your cell and feel a sense of dread. Measuring 5 feet by 9 feet and fitted out with one steel bed and one steel shelf, your entire worldly possessions amount to a toothbrush, some tooth powder, two towels, and a cup. What's strange is the silence, a very eerie silence. You've been told not to speak, but it's just strange that no one is. The last prison was nothing like this. Things become a bit clearer when you read the book that's been given to you entitled Regulations for Inmates USP Alcatraz. Inside, you read that your life won't be hard with a good conduct record and a good work record. In Section 5, it says you are entitled to food, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. Anything else that you get is a privilege. And let's just say they are deadly serious when it comes to taking your privileges away, which is one reason why people will soon be literally dying to get off that rock of Alcatraz. You'll learn that you might be working hard, and anything that gets in the way of that is a very serious offense. In fact, many things seem to constitute a serious offense, from mere loitering to loaning things out, especially gambling or talking back to the guards. The book explains that the morning bell goes off at 7 a.m., after which you will get ready and be standing by your cell door facing outward at 7.20 a.m. No noise is permitted, not even a whisper, and don't you dare look to your side once you're out of the cell. You will walk to the dining hall in single file, you cannot chat with the other prisoners, and you should not switch your place in line. Do not, it says, indulge in horseplay. Damn, you think, are they serious about this? Then you read in capital letters, you may be stopped and searched at any time, do not attempt to carry contraband. But things get a bit better, at least if you don't break the rules. There is a movie day twice a month, and if you're especially good, you might be allowed to play sports in the yard. At least after you finish your 30-day quarantine period, 
when you arrive at Alcatraz. Just get your work done 8 hours a day, 5 days a week, keep your cell clean, don't talk when you're not supposed to, and you'll get some of those privileges. So far, Alcatraz just sounds like a really strict prison, but some of the things we just mentioned drove some of those prisoners half mad, and sometimes seriously medically mad. They really weren't supposed to talk in their cells, ever, or at least when one warden was in charge. That total silence was deafening, and if anyone was caught trying to whisper a message to another prisoner, they could end up losing their privileges or even take a trip to D-Block, the home of the notorious Hole. The only time they could talk except from when they were out in the yard was when they were eating, and this living half their life in silence was not easy at all. The good news is the food was pretty good, with one of the wardens saying if a prisoner gets the right food he'll be much more useful at work and less prone to acting out. This was on the menu for one Alcatraz breakfast. Oatmeal, milk, sausage, fried potatoes, toast, and coffee. For dinner, they got bean soup, roast beef, and veg. For supper, they got pork and beans, salad, spiced apples, and more coffee and bread. The prisoners got some recreation time in the yard on weekdays, although just a few minutes. On Saturdays and Sundays, they got a good chunk of the morning in the yard and a couple hours in the afternoon. It was the same with public holidays. On top of that, many prisoners who didn't break the rules got to use the public library, with the average Alcatraz prisoner getting through 70 to 100 books a year from a stockpile of 10,000 to 15,000. So it wasn't all bad news getting sent to Alcatraz. One year after the prison opened its doors to around 240 prisoners, the Bureau of Prisons issued a report stating, the establishment of this institution not only provided a secure place for the detention of the more difficult type of criminal, but has had a good effect upon discipline in our other penitentiaries also. No serious disturbance of any kind has been reported during the year. Okay, so why did this place become known as Hellcatraz? That's what you want to know. Well, first of all, there was what the Bureau of Prisons was saying and what the prisoners said. The writer of that report we just mentioned there must have decided to skip the guard brutality part of life in Alcatraz. As you know, if prisoners towed the line, they were paid back in privileges. But you haven't heard about what happened when someone didn't tow the line. If you think breaking the rules wasn't easy to do, just imagine having to stay silent for hours on end. Imagine staying silent when a guard has his knees in your back and another is pummeling you over the head. Imagine trying not to speak when some dude is trying to extort you. Or just imagine keeping quiet when you just need to hear a voice when you're at your lowest depth and there's a guy next door to you. So, soon after it was opened, critics of Alcatraz were saying this was a project that just couldn't work. One of them called the place a great garbage can of San Francisco Bay, into which every federal prison dumped its most rotten apples. He, like the others, said when you dump a lot of desperate and broken men into one place, something sinister will start to happen. Alcatraz, they said, is a pressure cooker, a human time bomb. Even though the population was usually only 260 to 275 people and it rarely went above 300, you have to remember that this 1% of the entire US prison population at the time was often a violent bunch. The way to fix this, according to the authorities, was stricter measures, but these were men like Cool Hand Luke in that you just couldn't reach them. One of them was Robert Stroud, aka the Birdman of Alcatraz. Prior to arriving in Alcatraz, he'd murdered a prisoner in another prison and later killed a guard. This guy spent 54 years in prisons in total, 42 of which were in solitary confinement. In prison, he taught himself a lot about birds and actually became a fairly well-respected ornithologist, although he didn't actually keep birds in Alcatraz. In his former prison, he wrote the book Diseases of Canaries. But now in Alcatraz, and because of his violence, it was decided the way to rehabilitate him would be to deprive him of the things he most treasured. This was the Alcatraz way, and there's a good argument to suggest that it does not work. Stroud had run away from home at the age of 13 to escape a very violent father. He was obviously traumatized, and it was in prison where he seemed to get even more violent, so the authorities deemed him one of those incorrigibles. He was no doubt a dangerous prisoner, but you have to ask if the treatment he got at Alcatraz was a good thing. The man, who was later called a brilliant self-taught expert on birds and possibly the best-known example of self-improvement and rehabilitation in the US prison system, all that stopped at Alcatraz. Instead, he was called a psychopath and kept well away from birds. The silence was deafening in the normal cells. The isolation block was like living in outer space. There were 36 segregation cells as well as solitary confinement cells. These were called the hole. Here, prisoners often spent a grand total of 24 hours a day locked up, sometimes in the dark. Yeah, not even one hour out on most days. But they at least were taken to the yard at some point in the week. When that happened, the only other people in the yard were the guards. If they were following orders not to make chit-chat with the prisoner, that man never really got to talk to anyone. This is how you make men insane, which doesn't sound like rehabilitation or such a good thing for when some prisoners are released back into the public sphere. While in the hole, they didn't receive visits from the outside. Unlike prisoners in other blocks that got one visit per month if the warden granted them one, 
Even then, the prisoners and the visitors weren't allowed to touch each other and were not supposed to talk about current events or life in the prison. The former prisoner, Jim Quillen, has written about Alcatraz in the hole, and he didn't have much good to say about either. He was sent to Alcatraz in 1942, after not exactly being a model prisoner at San Quentin. In his book Inside Alcatraz, he explains the reason why people were sent there, saying, Rehabilitation was not part of the Alcatraz vocabulary or even considered. The institution was there for the purpose of proving to unruly prisoners that they had reached the ultimate termination of their undisciplined way of life. On the day he arrived, he was greeted by a straw mattress and a dirty pillow. He couldn't believe how quiet it was, but did say he kept hearing whispers of the word fish. Apparently, prisoners were excited that some fish had come into the prison. On that first night, he wasn't undressed and in bed as fast as he could have been. The guard walked up to his cell and said, get undressed right now or you'll be able to see what the hole feels like. In the end, Quillen did spend time in the hole that consisted of 24 hours a day in the pitch black. Food was shoved in now and again, and aside from the sound of scurrying rats, there was total silence. This is what Quillen said he did to keep sane. When I'd go in the hole, what I used to do was I'd tear a button off my coveralls, I'd flip it up in the air, then I'd turn around in circles, then I'd get down on my hands and knees, and then when I found the button, I'd stand up and I'd do it again. Other reports say men were sometimes beaten before they were stripped of their clothes and thrown into the cold floor. They were given no toothbrush or soap, although once a week a guard might appear to throw cold water over the prisoner. This was all designed to dehumanize the man, to make him feel like an animal. In the worst of the cells, known as the Oriental, there was a hole in the ground through which the men could pee and defecate, which gave the place a smell of sewer. They didn't poop that often anyway, seeing as the only thing they were given to eat were slices of moldy bread along with some water. It wasn't easy to stay out of the hole, never mind how good a prisoner's record was. As one former prisoner explained, men go slowly insane under the exquisite torture of restricted and undeviating routine. The wardens sometimes weren't even the biggest problem. Such was the case of a prisoner named the Rufa Percival. In the early 1900s, this man became a convicted killer. When he spent time at Arkansas State Penitentiary on the prison farm, he was handed a gun and told to shoot any inmates trying to escape from the farm. Such were the times. He apparently shot and killed a few prisoners while maiming others. This job didn't really do much for his popularity in the prison. So when he later ended up in Alcatraz, you could say he didn't have the best of reputations among the prisoners. What's strange is that even with all those strict rules, it's said that other prisoners had many opportunities to bully Percival to the extreme. This is no doubt happening most of the time in the yard. Not only that, but the conditions of Alcatraz had a profound effect on Percival's mental well-being. He was beaten senseless whenever prisoners got close to him, and so the prison decided the best thing for him was to stay in the confinement cells. This made him the most guarded prisoner in Alcatraz. Then in 1936, he wrote a letter to James A. Johnston, the prison warden, and asked for a transfer. This was not forthcoming, and Percival was told he'd be staying in his solitary hell. No sooner than he got out of solitary, he managed to get his hands on a prison axe, which he used to cut off his fingers, apparently grinning like a madman as he did so. When he was finally diagnosed as being partially insane after complaining of seeing an alligator in his cell, but then, after again being bullied and beaten badly at the prison, he was transferred. He later actually requested to be sent back to the hole in Alcatraz after getting beaten up in his new prison. As the story goes, he was beaten for the rest of his stay, but he was never arrested for committing a crime again after he got out. He died an old man in 1991. His story just goes to show how Alcatraz was designed not to rehabilitate, but to break. Now we need to talk about a convicted killer and a bank robber named Henry Young. He was a violent man, becoming known as a bank robber who was quick to use extreme violence on hostages. He also became one of the biggest names that ever went through the doors in Alcatraz. There's a movie centered around him called Murder in the First, although the depiction of Young being a nice, non-violent guy is certainly not true in the slightest. Some things are true, though, such as this. On January 3, 1939, Young and four other prisoners named Arthur Barker, Rufus McCain, Dale Stamphill, and William Martin tried to escape. It didn't go too well for the criminal quintet, and Barker and Stamphill lost their lives after being shot. The movie also correctly depicts Young stabbing McCain less than a year later, causing an injury that proved to be fatal. He never said exactly why he did it, but his attorneys tried to fight his case by saying his time in solitary confinement had driven him to the edge of madness. Alcatraz found itself on trial. Young described his time in the hole, a period of months, not years, as the movie says. He wrote, You are stripped nude and pushed into the cell. There's no soap, no tobacco, no toothbrush. You have no shoes, no bed, no mattress, nothing but the four damp walls and two blankets. The walls are painted black. Once a day, I got three slices of bread. No, that's an error. Some days I got four slices. This wasn't a good look for the authorities, although the jury ruled in favor of the prison when the case went to trial. The warden said the sadistic behavior that Young talked about just didn't happen. 
and a man named James V. Bennett, the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, wrote in 1941 that the awful conditions of Alcatraz were grossly exaggerated. Part of his long statement read, I have visited Alcatraz frequently, as have various members of our staff, and know personally most of the inmates, including Young. As a matter of fact, I have on several occasions personally interviewed Young and done everything possible to obtain his cooperation. I have never found or had called to my attention any authentic case of brutality or inhumanity at Alcatraz. So, did Alcatraz really deserve the nickname of Hellcatraz? To answer that, we need to hear from more former prisoners, and there is no one better to ask than a man named Alvin Creepy Carpus. He was one of the many gangsters that came to the public eye during the Great Depression in the USA, although he was the only man of four that did enough crime to get himself in on the FBI's enemy number one list. The others were the prolific criminals John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Babyface Nelson. What makes Carpus stand out is that he was the only one of them to be captured and spend a long time in prison. In fact, his 26 years behind bars on The Rock made him the longest serving Alcatraz prisoner of all time. Carpus wrote about some of the people he'd met in Alcatraz, saying that the legendary gangster Al Capone was often seen strumming his tenor banjo during recreation time. He called Machine Gun Kelly a big mouth and a compulsive liar, and said that the famed Birdman of Alcatraz was a total maniac. What's perhaps more surprising was his unlikely friendship with a man he described as mild-mannered, lazy, and shiftless. That man was none other than Charles Manson, whom Carpus taught to play guitar. This was the young Charles Manson a good few years before he'd started his murderous cult, and according to some researchers might have been part of the CIA's MKUltra program. Carpus wrote of this kid who just couldn't stop getting himself arrested. The youngster's been in institutions all his life, first orphanages, then reformatories, and finally federal prison. His mother, a prostitute, was never around to look after him. I decide it's time someone did something for him, and to my surprise, he learns quickly. He has a pleasant voice and a pleasing personality, although he's unusually meek and mild for a convict. If that makes it sound like Alcatraz was a place where people sat around singing songs and having fun, Carpus wrote time and again about the brutality of the guards against people he believed had just a bad start in life. He summed up his 26 years by calling them an empty, futile experience. Carpus also talked about the riots, the day-to-day -day violence, the horrors of the whole, and some of those very violent escape attempts. But, as you already know, some of them ended with inmates as well as prison officers getting shot. But the question is, did anyone really come close to getting off that island? We can tell you that any attempt to do that had a significant effect on a man's life expectancy. Take for instance the time in 1938 when a bunch of men tried to escape during a prison workshop. That day, Officer Royal Klein had for a brief moment stopped watching the men to take an inventory of supplies in another room. When he returned to the main workshop, Thomas Limerick, James Lucas, and Rufus Whitey Franklin were in the midst of trying to get out the window. They attacked Klein with a hammer, which eventually led to his death. Their plan was to get to the roof and scale down the building where they believed they could get their hands on a police boat, but Officer Harold Stites got to them before that and opened fire. Limerick died, and both Lucas and Franklin were handed life sentences, as well as having to spend six years in the hole. Lucas is also famous for attacking Al Capone, with the reason being that Capone refused to take part in a prison strike. So again, when we consider this strike and the fact that prisoners were willing to risk their lives or life sentences to escape, you can be sure that some of them really believed that Alcatraz was a living hell. Both Lucas and Franklin were in for bank robbery and car theft, and had they not tried to escape, they might have left Alcatraz with much of their lives left to live. As it turns out, Franklin died a year after he got paroled in 1974. Lucas went on to work in the oil business after he got out in 1970. He died in 1988, age 86. The very first person who attempted to escape from Alcatraz was a prisoner named Joseph Bowers. Two years after being sent to Alcatraz in 1934 for stealing some mail with a firearm in his hands, he ended up on the prison roof. As to why he was there will always remain a mystery, with some reports stating he was trying to get some food back that was stuck on some barbed wire. He apparently had been feeding the seagulls. But when the guard told him to get down, it seems Bowers didn't do as he was told. He was shot and fell 60 feet to the rocks below. There was no way he was surviving that. It was stated that Bowers had lost his mind with the incredibly strict confines of the prison. He also was described as a desperado and a loner, unable to come to terms with the conditions of Alcatraz, in prison during the toughest and most strict era. That's one thing to note, there were four wardens in total during the time that Alcatraz functioned as a prison from 1934 to 1963, and some of them were way stricter than others. From 1934 to 1948, the warden was James Aloysius Johnston. Even though he was against barbarism, it's this guy that came up with the code of silence prisoners had to follow. He might have been against beatings, straitjackets, and other sadistic measures, but it seems his very strict disciplinary attitude was too much for many inmates. 
two prisoners named Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe would have agreed. Both those guys were bank robbers and before going to Alcatraz, they'd attempted to escape from another prison, hence the reason that they were sent to this supposedly escape-proof rock. In 1937, they hatched their plan, and then on December 16th, they decided it was time to go. The conditions were both good and bad for escape. Good because there was a thick fog that day over the bay, and bad because in December, the water is really cold. When a head count was taken at 1.30 p.m., it showed two people less than expected. It was soon evident that these two had sawn through their cell bars, scaled down a fence, and then forced open a gate with a wrench that they'd stolen from the workshop. The thing was, that dense fog made it possible for them to do this without anyone seeing them. Guards later found that wrench. They discovered footprints on the beach where they'd landed, but after a long and hard search, they could not find the men. It was presumed that rather than make a raft of any sort, They'd use stolen canisters and tires as floats, both of which the men had worked with in the prison. But the tides at the time would have likely carried them into the Pacific Ocean, and anyway, even if they were expert swimmers, the 46 to 58 degree Fahrenheit water at that time of the year would have likely killed them. Over the years, the FBI didn't give up looking for the two men. There were some identifications now and again from the public and also a rumor they were living in South America, but if they did indeed survive, we'll never know. Others in time would also get into that water, but not escape. So the question is, is it possible to swim the one and a half miles to the nearest point to the bay shore? As many of you regular swimmers will know, that is hardly a long distance for a good swimmer. People often swim across the English Channel, which is 21 miles and 57 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit in summer. Well, people do swim from Alcatraz to the shore, and they do it quite often. One website that talks about this great swim had this to say about it. Despite lore that swimming from Alcatraz is dangerous, for experienced swimmers with proper support, swimming from Alcatraz can be safe and fun. Okay, so these people often wear wetsuits, have a big meal in them prior to setting off, and have a bunch of folks around them who would help them if they got into trouble. But what if escapees were strong swimmers, healthy, well-fed, and maybe had some help with a raft? What if the conditions were pretty good the day they went? Let's also just recall here that the guards back in the day would have loved telling the story of all those great white sharks that inhabited the water close to Alcatraz, but truth be known, they very rarely swim that close to the island and would certainly be a long way down the list of any rational thinking prisoners' fears. Many people agree with the cold and the sometimes unpredictable movement of the water that you'd really have to be a good swimmer to get to the other side. Also, you wouldn't necessarily need a wetsuit. Many that swim it now don't bother with one. One of them just recently said this on a web forum. Alcatraz is an extremely fun swim. I encourage anyone to do it. Still, he said that time your swim right or you could end up getting carried out to sea. Another swimmer who did it without a wetsuit said, When I arrived to shore, it took me several seconds to get my legs to work as they were numb. He also said it was fun, but never again. And get this, in 1959, prisoner AZ1403 did get to the shore on the other side. His name was John Paul Scott. He got all the way to Fort Point beneath the Golden Gate Bridge, but it seems the swim had done him in. A bunch of teenagers found him curled up in a ball suffering from hypothermia. Cops were on the scene in 20 minutes and he was soon back to Alcatraz. Apparently, he wasn't such a great swimmer, but also had been helped a lot by a favorable tide. And this brings us arguably to the best Alcatraz story of them all. On June 11, 1962, there was an escape like no other. The men involved were Frank Morris, Alan West, and the brothers John and Clarence Anglin. Morris had spent much of his youth in prison, with crimes ranging from car theft to drug possession. He escaped from Louisiana State Penitentiary while doing time for bank robbery, and in 1960 he was sent to Alcatraz. Notably, his IQ was said to be 133 in the 98th percentile for IQs. For those of you who don't know what that means, it means only two out of a hundred people have an IQ like his. John and Clarence Anglin were also career criminals, but it's said during their robberies they always made sure no one got hurt. They weren't violent criminals, just kids who'd grown up on the wrong side of the track. They also said that when they held up banks, they only ever used a toy gun that didn't matter to the authorities, and they were handed lengthy sentences when caught. After some escape attempts at other prisons, they were subsequently sent to Alcatraz. Even more notable is that when these two were kids, both of them were said to be outstanding swimmers. Not only that, they at times astonished their friends by swimming great distances in Lake Michigan when there was ice floating on the water. For these two, given conditions weren't totally against them, completing that Alcatraz escape swim would have been a breeze. The guy named Alan West was also involved in the escape, but he didn't get too far on the night it happened. In short, these men spent a lot of time using things such as spoons to dig out the cement in the walls where the vents were. They even fashioned a kind of drill they'd made from bits of a vacuum cleaner. When the drilling happened, someone played the accordion to mask the noise. Once they could get through the hole, they managed to walk through a corridor and set up their own workshop in a closed-off space. There, they used around 50 raincoats to make workable life preservers and even their very own 6 by 14 foot rubber raft. 
All this needed stitching and heating at the seams, which was a lot of work but possible with steam from vents. It also took a fair amount of intelligence, which they all seemed to have. And when they were working and missing from their beds, it wasn't a problem because they'd made dummies to put under the blankets replete with painted human-looking paper mache heads. If you're wondering how the hell they blew up vests in a raft, they modified an accordion and used it as a pump. But on the night they left, Wes discovered to his disbelief that some of the cement he'd used around his vent had gotten too hard. He had to stay behind, but the rest of them took their equipment and scaled down to the beach. That was it. They were gone. And because of their dummy heads, the alarm wasn't raised until the next morning. With Pi now in its face, the FBI ended up finding some personal effects and possible bits of the raft and life jackets. But there was no sign of any bodies, and remember, these guys could swim. It was also June, not the worst time to be in the water, even if the prison purposefully made the shower water hot so the men couldn't get used to cold water. The FBI kept on looking for them and didn't close the case until 1979. Again, there had been sightings and lots of rumors of them being alive, but they drifted from the public consciousness. Then in 2013, the FBI got a letter. They didn't make it public for five years, though. Part of it read, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morse. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. It said Morris died in 2008 and Clarence in 2011. He also stated, If you announce on TV that I will be promised to just go to jail for no more than a year and get some medical attention, I will write back to let you know where exactly I am. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. The FBI didn't bother with a reply, so we have no idea if the letter was real. But what's more shocking is what two nephews of the Anglin brothers later said. They are Ken and David Widner. In 2016, they told The Guardian they knew the brothers had survived. They say they had documents that proved their escape was successful, including a photo. They also said they have a bad relationship with the FBI and U.S. Marshals after years of harassment. They disbelieved that Clarence and John's brother was electrocuted while trying to escape the Kilby Correctional Facility years later after the brothers had left Alcatraz. Instead, they say he was probably beaten to death during an interrogation because he knew where the brothers were. They knew he knew where they were, David Widner has said, and the family really believed they beat him to death trying to get him to tell them where these boys were. One thing that is undeniable is men would literally risk a death to get out of that prison, even if the authorities often played down how bad it was inside. But when it did close in 1963, it wasn't because of human rights abuses. But the fact was it was too expensive to keep it open. Now you need to watch a show about one of Alcatraz's most famous prisoners in Machine Gun Kelly, The Life and Crimes of Public Enemy No. 1, or have a look at possibly the craziest prisoner ever, and man so violent even other prisoners fear him.